everyone, Kevin here, and thanks for watching The Bottom Line. This series is all about custom lower trucks, and not only am I a representative, I'm also a full-fledged member of the community. All right, bad jokes aside, what I'm talking about is I have a few trucks of my own, including this uh, 62 GMC I'm driving right now, and uh, I also live in uh, Orange County, California, and it's a kind of a weird place for a truck like this because there's a lot of housewives with luxury cars, and they see a truck like this and they think, uh, it's just a bucket of bolts and I'm in the way. And really that's not the truth because uh, it's got it where it counts. And what I'm talking about is it has a uh, 383 stroker uh, small block Chevy engine underneath the hood. And uh, it's got over 400 horsepower on the thing. So I could really smoke these people uh, quite easily. And uh, so one of the uh, links in that chain that helps uh, uh, get the performance out of this engine is uh, the set of headers I've got on the exhaust. And um, that's going to be the topic for today, and we're going to head down to uh, Headman Performance in uh, Whittier, California, and check them out and see how uh, headers are made and discuss uh, everything about them. All right, so we made it here to uh, Headman's facility, and uh, surprisingly enough, we didn't have too much traffic, which is kind of a rare thing here in Southern California. But uh, we have Mark here, and he's been with the company for a while. Mark, can you tell me how long uh, Headman has been around and how it started? Uh, well, Headman has been around since 1954. We're one of the oldest uh, manufacturers in the industry. I mean, we're, when you think of uh, the beginning of hot rodding, you think of Edel Rock, Isky Cams, and Headman Headers is another brand that's within that group. Um, so Bob Hedman was just a regular hot rodder like everyone else. He would go out to uh, race on the, uh, the flatbeds here in Southern California with his buddies and he would make headers and he would perform better. So everyone kind of asked him, hey, can you make me a set? And little by little, it just snowballed into him working at a, um, a muffler shop that he finally bought. And then that turned into a header company, which is what we are today, 100,000 square foot from a little garage. Yeah, I think that's always the key to uh, making a uh, creation of new parts. It's, it's always necessity and everything. But um, what I want to find out is what are, what are the differences of a header and what does it actually do for performance? All right, well, in a nutshell, it will improve the uh, combustion efficiency of your engine because uh, in between uh, exhaust pulses, you are going to want to clear out as much of, of the spent gases that are in the combustion chamber and a set of uh, cast manifolds isn't very good at doing that so a longer i mean like you look at how short these runners are here this is on a truck and just imagine the uh the exhaust fighting for the the tube space to get out of the engine and what that does it creates a backlog of of exhaust in the combustion chamber that prevents more fresh air fuel from getting into the combustion chamber which creates a bigger boom which when you put that all together creates more torque and horsepower I notice you have a number of different products here on this table. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about their differences? Uh, well, aside from the obvious color difference, uh, you know, we've got a different styles. I mean, this here is basically a generic type of, of street rod header for, uh, for Hemis. Uh, it's super close. If you take a look at it, when that's on the engine, uh, it's going to be super close to the block, giving you a lot of clearance for frame rails and so on. And then these other two, these are all specific uh, headers for uh, small block Ford uh, 64 Mustang, say, and then an older 67 Camaro. Now, I noticed that the uh, lengths of the runners are a little bit different. Um, does that have any effect on performance? Uh, it does in, uh, in the long run. Um, uh, the determining factor is going to be the output of the engine. So uh, the higher en engine horsepower, you're going to want to have a larger tube. So it's going to dictate also the, the runner length as well. Now, if somebody's looking to you uh, to get a set of headers, they, you know, they, they want to get some more performance out of their engine, uh, what do they need to look for as far as uh, application-wise? Oh, well, that's actually quite a bit that they need to uh, consider, uh, not just uh, the year-making model of the car and the engine, but they want to know what kind of heads. If you're using an aftermarket head, what kind of head is it? What's uh, the port size? Is it square? Is it a D port? Is it round? Is it a dog leg? You need to have that. You need to know transmission because the header is going to uh, differ perhaps based on whether it's an automatic or a uh, standard transmission transmission. Uh, do you have power steering? Uh, is the power steering a close ratio? Like if you have a Camaro with a close ratio steering box, it has a bigger box and that's going to interfere with the standard header. So you, we've, we've come across uh, things like this in, in the past and we uh, address it with a specific header. Well, um, some great information there. Uh, one thing I do want to know is that um, <clears throat> because they do have different lengths and everything, uh, you do want to be mindful of your application. Uh, one uh, little thing that I mean I can share with you is that you know we do post uh, a lot of slam trucks 
and if you have a header that uh, hangs down be below the fr frame rail, uh, that's not going to work because basically you're not you're going to be sitting on your uh, exhaust, and you don't want to do that because you'll crack them or, or do something like that. Uh, so do keep that in mind. But uh, one uh, last thing that I do want to see here and check out is uh, there's a little bit of a monstrosity right behind you, uh -huh. and what exactly is that? Well. We're not all business here. We like to have fun. So we go out on the track. This here is actually a Bigfoot uh, monster truck header. Uh, we've been making uh, headers for uh, Bigfoot since the very beginning of their existence back in the 70s. Uh, you know, we've dealt with them and uh, like the IROC series, we used to uh, provide them with the exhaust products for the IROC series. So we uh, have been on the track for a while and we like having fun too. I'm super pumped to see something like that because honestly, um, this is a piece of history. Uh, the Bigfoot truck <clears throat> uh, really uh, coined the term monster truck. So it's a part of uh, history in trucks uh, all around. So very cool to see this piece in person. But uh, hey, Mark, uh, can we uh, go to the back to factory and uh, just uh, give me a rundown of uh, how headers are made? Absolutely, it's gonna be pretty fun. All right, so we made our way to the back of the building. And as you can see behind me, there's a bunch of uh, big tubes um, so I would assume this is where uh, headers actually start this raw material so uh, did I guess correctly Mark? <laughs> Correct very me if good I'm guess wrong. very good <laughs> guess my gosh you're genius so um, yeah actually every set of headers that we manufacture starts with a 20 foot length of tube and then from there we take it over to the coal cutters and they'll cut it, uh, each tube down to a specific length depending upon the the primary uh, and the header that they're using so uh, it could be as close as an eighth inch tolerance between the length of the header you know 27 and 1 8 inches uh, from there, what they'll do is they'll take it to a, another device, as you see, that will take the end of the tube, because uh, when we cold cut it, it has a rounded edge on the end, and then this will spin it around, and it ends up with a flat tube at the end, so it slips right onto the mandrel bender. So moving forward in the building here, um, there's a bunch of machinery behind me. I would assume this is where all the magic happens. Uh, so Mark, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, no, you're totally right. This is the heart and soul of Headman. Uh, this is the only digitized or computerized part of the entire process. Everything else is done manually by hand. But when we create a header, we'll go ahead and we'll break it apart and we will vectorize each of the tubes. And then that program is sent over to these uh, mandrel benders and then it, it's run from there. And it basically starts with this here and we put it on to the, uh, under the mandrel, and when they're done, it's gonna look out like, like this. So you start with that, come out with this, and, and throughout the process, as they're running them, while it's, it's going ahead and, and doing a, uh, a bend, they'll actually take one of these over to the jigs, and they'll test it out, make sure it's fitting where it's supposed to be, uh, so that when all the components, the, the tubes, the flanges, and collectors all get over to our welding stations, everything's all been test fit as it goes through the entire process, and it's gonna fit. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think uh, the, the mandrel bend process, uh, you got a piece that goes inside the tube mm -hmm. while it bends uh, to make sure that the form is still, uh, I guess, uh, uh, round all the way around, um, to, so to say, right. uh, so that you don't um, you know, lose any flow in that. Because if you were to do uh, an old school like pipe bender or something like that, the inside would get a little bit smaller in right, the material. So, and uh, you would kind of rob you of that flow uh, and I would assume that your performance as right. well. Yeah, it's like comparing a, a cheap exhaust uh, shop doing your exhaust bend and they have wrinkles and versus a mandrel bend, which is what we have here. And if you take a look at the, uh, the mandrel on this here, it's got these bearings here that are flexible. So everything goes on straight and as it runs, it pulls the tube out and it bends around these here uh, and it prevents the tube from collapsing. So it keeps the same circumference all the way uh, through the bend. Yeah, and like you said, uh, everything's uh, pre-programmed, so uh, it's all gonna stay the same. So once you guys have like uh, figured it out, uh, you know, a prototype or anything like that, then uh, make sure that everything runs for anybody that uh, purchases a set, you know, so it all is the, exactly the same to what they designed it right. as. When the tubes come out of there, are they exactly to length or is there some trimming that needs to be done? Well, we try and make them as close to what the finished length is going to be just to reduce the waste. It's one of our ways that we are able to stay competitive and still manufacture in the U.S. Uh, but there has to be a little bit extra in there because we trim them down. So what happens is the, um, the guy who's doing the cutting, he's got a jig and each jig has two positions on it. So he's going to go ahead and he's going to cut one end of the tube take it, flip around, put it back in the jig in the second position, and he's gonna cut the other end. So that what happens is when they put it into the jig, it's gonna match up. You don't wanna have the tubes at different lengths at the collector and at the flange. Everything needs to be cut at the uh, right length so that when they go to weld, the guy's just weld. He's not having to fits around with the wrong fitting tube. So Mark, you talked earlier about um, 
the ports being a, a point where you can get robbed of power. And uh, I've noticed that the tubes are, you know, completely round. Uh, so how do they take form uh, so that we get that better flow? Uh, all that's taken care of here in the swedging department and basically they'll take any of the round tubes and they'll turn them into square ports, D ports, oval ports, uh, dog leg ports, whatever that particular application requires and they match them and then they'll test fit each one into the flange in the jig and make sure that it's the right, uh, right uh, dimensions and, and shape. So I've assumed that uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, the tubes are kind of ready to be welded up or um, made uh, made one, uh, made an actual into into a header. So can we see that process? Uh, sure, yeah. Before we get ahead of ourselves, uh, I think there's another uh, couple pieces that have to be made before uh, the headers actually can come together and be welded. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, w what are these pieces? Okay, well this is a collector and this is the, the part of the, uh, the header that is at the end that you hook up to your uh, exhaust system. So if you noticed, ours is not a, a gasket style collector. We use a ball flange and this here, uh, it meets up with a socket that gets welded onto your exhaust. So it's a gasket free design to just take the bolts, go through it and you lock it in place. Now, another good thing about this being, uh, aside from being gasket free, is that if you're uh, not perfectly aligned with a gasket, you can have a gaps and you get uh, leaks. With a ball collector, you can be slightly skew and you're still gonna get a good solid seal on the exhaust. That's great, you get a little bit of forgiveness there. <laughs> right, um, now it is a multi, it's like a product by itself. It's got a few different steps and all, like uh, everything else we make, it starts with a basic uh, piece of tube that's been cut down to the right length. Then it'll go on to the uh, former, which takes, this here is actually on the machine like that. And it presses down to give this cone shape here. Next it goes on another machine that has this flower shape that is actually going to be, uh, it's going to create the flower shape. And then last but not least, after that is created, that have there, they'll put the flange on here and then it'll be put on the machine when it's activated, it'll create the ball. And then it's locked on there for good. Now, um, you've got the collector and everything, but what about the inside of the tubes and making sure that, uh, that there's no uh, air leaking out or anything like that? What do you do for that? Okay, well, there's actually the most important part of the header is called the star weld. And that goes in between the four tubes. If there's a four tube, if it's a three tube, then it'd be a triangle. But uh, you would take that to start and it gets welded in between those tubes and, and closes the gap uh, and not allowing any of the exhaust to escape through there. So once the tubes get uh, welded up together, what's this next little process that happens? Oh, so what this guy at the end does is he takes the, the header and he puts it on this pedestal and it's like a rotisserie that he can turn around with his foot. So he puts it on there and he's going to take and weld the collector all the way around. The original guy who did all the main welding and the main jig, he just tack welded the collector in a position. And this guy here is finished welding the, uh, the collector and he's also putting on the headman tag. Well, it looks like everything's together. Like the header's all welded up. It's got the logo on it, everything. Is it ready to be shipped out or is there more to the process than that? Uh, no, there are some, some additional uh, items that need to be handled. They want to clear up. They're going to go ahead and grind the, the flanges down here. Uh, they're going to then take it from here over to the uh, fine tuning department is what I call it, where they actually take each set of headers and they'll test fit it on the head to make sure all the bolt holes fit. They'll ream out uh, the bolt holes, make sure that uh, if there's any issue that's taken care of. They'll also deburr the ports themselves to get out any uh, slag or, or uh, weld splatter. And one thing I wanted to ask is that, uh, you know, having to set myself uh, and putting them on my, uh, my engine, uh, that the bolts kind of have to go in, you know, a certain way, you know, the clearances are tight. Um, are there anything, is there anything that we need, uh, you guys need to do to make sure that the bolts go in? Yeah, we actually have a special station that handles that. I mean, we know when we manufacture or design the header, whether there's going to be a uh, clearance issue with bolt holes. So uh, we'll go ahead and actually have the guy heat up the, the tube. They'll dimple it with a special tool and then they'll take a jig and test fit the bolt, and make sure it goes in without any problem. So it was super cool watching how these things come together. But uh, one thing I did notice, Mark, is that uh, there are some different finishes. And can you explain what these things are? Okay, well, aside from the uncoated, which uh, you saw the guys painting it, and I consider that uncoated. It's, it's a water-based paint that's gonna burn off after a few minutes. It's just really to protect a header against corrosion while it's in inventory or on its way over to you. Uh, but if it's not that uncoated, it'll have one of three finishes, whether it's a 304 stainless header or a mild steel header, it's gonna come with one of three. And uh, the first one is going to be on our Elite header. It's exclusively to our Elite header. It's a uh, silver matte finish. Uh, what it has done is it's sprayed, baked, and then it's left as it is. Uh, the next is our HTC coated, which is our oldest model or oldest style of coating, and we started that uh, in 84. We, we stole it from the aerospace industry, and that is the same as the uh, 
the Elite finish, the matte finish, except after it's coated and baked, it's put in a uh, vibratory machine and it's polished that way. Uh, and then the third and final is our Black Max, which is a uh, satin black finish. And it's the same material again, but it has a black pigment on it that gives you that nice black finish for a dark uh, blacked out murder look. Really cool. Um, I really like the HCC look, um, but uh, tell me a little bit about the uh, longevity of that. And uh, will it, uh, you know, if I install one of those, is it going to look like that for, uh, you know, a couple years, uh, decades? Is it going to uh, shine the same afterwards? Well, not if you don't take care of it. But if you take care of it, first of all, we have a five year warranty uh, against rust through. Um, but uh, you really want to, every month you want to go over the, uh, the header uh, surface with uh, just uh, water or some uh, mild solution just to clean off any, uh, anything that's fallen on. If you spill any oil on it, if you're doing oil change or any kind of fluid, you want to wipe that down clean. Make sure you get all that off of the surface before you heat it up. Uh, fingerprints too. You want to make sure when you're installing it, wipe it down with uh, just some uh, mild soapy solution or water before you start the engine up because those will bake on there. You will never get it out. Awesome, really cool, <clears throat> and um, thanks for showing me around. And um, we're gonna head outside and just uh, show you my truck and just uh, show you what a set of headers looks like when it's installed. So I drove my truck here and we talked all about um, it having a set of headers on it. So uh, let's take a peek under the hood and see what it looks like. Here we have our 383 uh, Stroker uh, small block Chevy engine and uh, we got a set of headers which are actually for uh, later model C10s and uh, they weren't really designed for this truck. Um, we kind of just uh, modified the frame a little bit, banged on it a bit, heated it up and uh, got them to fit pretty well. Um, as you uh, can notice that the finish has doled out a bit. Like Mark said earlier, um, we had that high shine on it but we did break in the engine with it so uh, that wasn't the correct way to go otherwise it would look um, still nice and shiny. We also did get a set of uh, uh, Transdap uh, fin valve covers, uh, which is also a part of the uh, Headman umbrella. But uh, let's take this thing out for a spin and just kind of show you what it does. talking about so um yeah obviously as you can see these headers did a lot for the performance of this truck and i hope you liked that video if you did uh hit that subscribe button give us a like as well if you have any questions drop them in the comments below and uh we will catch you next time